Now, what are the current methods for early detection and secondary prevention of colon cancer? These include fecal cold blood testing, or FIT, barium enema, sigmoidoscopy, colonoscopy and polypectomy, virtual colonoscopy, stool-based DNA assays, and capsule endoscopy. And I'm gonna just touch on these. But the first thing I'd like to touch upon is really, what are the national societies now recommending for our patients? So multiple societies have grouped together to try to guide practitioners as to which would be the most effective way to screen and to survey their patients. And at this point in time, the three biggest societies, the Multi-Society Joint Task Force, um, the U.S. Protective Service Society, and the American College of Gastroenterology have handed down different guidelines for practitioners, which include two groups of tests. The first would be tests that can help detect polyps and cancer, and tests that just actually detect cancer. So those tests that could detect both polyps and cancer include colonoscopy, flexible sigmoidoscopy, CT colonoscopy, and double contrast barium enema. Tests that detect cancer only are FOBT, fecal DNA tests, and FIT. Now the reason why each of these are important is because different strategies, as I said, have been handed down. Almost all the societies believe that screening should typically begin at the age of 50 in an average risk patient. And if it was being done by colonoscopy, it should be done every 10 years. The ACG, however, believes that in patients of African-American descent, colonoscopy should actually begin five years earlier at the age of 45, but there continue on every 10 years. The other screening tests could include flexible sigmoidoscopy. That should start every five years. Um, CT colonoscopy, also every five years, and that's recommended by the Multi-Society Joint Task Force. Um, but the United Services Task Force really doesn't believe there's significant evidence to use this at this time. When we look at barium enema, it really is falling out of phase at this time. And the other task force also make different recommendations regarding the stool-based test. So FLBT refers to collecting a testing of six samples of stool from three consecutive stools at home. Patients are given instructions to avoid aspirin and NSAIDs, usually for seven days. They can't take vitamin C in excess and they're supposed to avoid red meat. Basically, the societies at this point in time really are against using FOBT at this point in time. And FIT, which is a newer fecal immunochemical test, has really replaced that. This is able to detect the globulin protein of hemoglobin um, in stool, and it's certainly much more accurate than FOBT. It doesn't require any dietary modifications, and it's performed by the patient at home and mailed to the physician's office in the lab. Barium enema, as I mentioned, some of the societies still can advocate it, but certainly in practice, this is really something you would be hard pressed to actually find a radiologist that still is doing barium enema, and certainly there are far and few gastroenterologists at a time are doing barium enema for colorectal cancer screening. The limitations and the reason why that is, is really the miss rate for both cancers and polyps in barium enema is just too high to still consider it an adequate tool for colorectal cancer screening. What about sigmoidoscopy? Well, this is falling in and out of favor. Certainly the miss rate uh, for lesions is significant in uh, flexible sigmoidoscopy, and as obviously one would understand this because you're only actually looking at half of the colon. So for proximal cancers, the miss rate can be 65%, and there can be an, ad an advanced adenomas, a risk of over 50% in missing lesions. That's why to date, colonoscopy certainly by ACG is considered the preferred screening uh, test, 
and the other societies certainly advocate this as managing, playing the major role in screening. What is the biggest uh, thing that patients hate about colonoscopy? It's certainly the prep. Time and again, patients just do not look forward to doing it. Um, there's just no way around it. The prep is incredibly important and there are multiple studies to show that the adequacy of the prep itself plays a significant role in the detection of polyps and in cancers. And we can see that the quality of the exam is directly related to how good the prep is. What about virtual colonoscopy? This obviously also does play some role. Um, and what is happening in this is that this is a 3D rendered CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis. It does require a bowel preparation. A small tube is placed in the rectum through which air is insufflated. And if polyps are detected, a colonoscopy is required to remove them. It's currently not covered by many insurances. Um, there have been multiple studies. Um, this one is just looking at the one from New England Journal of Medicine, looking at uh, CT uh, colonoscopy or virtual colonoscopy to screen for colorectal cancer in asymptomatic adults. As we can see, in comparison uh, to optical colonoscopy, you know, the rates are really good for large polyps. The problem is, um, in most studies, when polyps get lower, they're not reading uh, uh, the polyps, the small polyps. In fact, when you ask a radiologist whether or not a polyp less than one centimeter is significant, they just don't believe it's significant and it's not read actually on a test result. Now, when we think about this, um, the polyp threshold and what percentage of patients would require a colonoscopy, um, if six millimeter polyps were considered important, then 30% of patients would eventually require a colonoscopy being done after a virtual colonoscopy. Um, as polyp size got bigger, but certainly if a colonoscopy in a patient, and this was in one of the studies, missed an 11 millimeter malignant polyp, um, subsequently, uh, which was found on unblinding a colonoscopy, obviously, no one would want to be the bearer of bad news that this was not identified. So I think at this point in time, using CT colonography as a screening tool, some of the societies really believe we have to be weary of using this, and I think further studies need to be able to show whether or not this will play a major role in colon cancer screening. What about sample collection for stool DNA? Uh, this is a way that in the privacy of one's home, um, one could sit on the toilet, collect their stool, put it into a box, and send it for later, later DNA analysis. It involves a targeting, looking for multiple uh, DNA uh, uh, mutations in the stool. And this slide just shows several of the point mutations, which include KRAS, APC, P15, um, microsatellite instability markers. And this reflects abnormalities in the apoptosis pathway. Its, its sensitivity is only about 65% and the specificity is 95%, but these have gotten better uh, with newer technology. It's not covered by many insurances and it's still expensive. Uh, so the role of DNA stool-based testing is still not mainstream in colorectal cancer screening.